Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is Beatrice Perkins with Leica Conversations, sponsored by Leica Camera USA and Leica Academy. And I'm so glad that you all are joining us today for an amazing conversation that we have with Debbie Cornwall and Elizabeth Avedon. I see we have so many people joining today already. It looks like we have everyone chiming in. We have people from Bellevue, Washington. We've got New York in the scene. We've got Los Angeles. We've got Maine. Hi, Susan from Maine. Get to know one another. Let's hear where you're dialing in from. We've got Cindy from LA. Oh, we've got Illinois. We've got Michigan. I could go through for probably the rest of this program giving shout outs, so I won't do that. I want to talk to you today about an amazing opportunity that we have for the Leica Women Photo Project Award. Now, you're a few of the first people to hear about this award that we have. We did it for the first time last year, and we just announced our call for submissions yesterday. Now, one of the guests that we have today, Debbie Cornwall, is a recipient of that award last year, and Elizabeth Avedon is one of our judges from last year who's graciously joined to be a judge again this year. I'm gonna give you a little bit of inspiration in brief here. You can go to our website, we'll post it in the chat as well as you'll have it in your newsletters to give you a glimpse of what we're looking at. We want 10 images of which four were created either this year or last year. We're looking for a brief project statement, including what the topic represents, we have some criteria on the site that can guide you a bit more about that. And then we want an artist bio, and there are amazing prizes for you. So we have three winners, one of which we've already said is Debbie Cornwall, who's a participant in our program today. But you get a $10,000 cash award for this. And that $10,000 is for you to be able to continue and complete the project that you start with this program and with this submission as well as one of our Leica Q2 cameras or an equivalent. I love this camera, so I have to just kind of show you all. This is what we're talking about, people. You don't have to worry about getting a lens for it. It's an all-in-one. This is what everyone wants to take with them when they step out of the house. Sometimes for women, you don't want to walk out without your makeup. For photographers, it's this. So with that said, I want to give you a proper introduction for our amazing guest today. So we have Debbie Cornwall, a former, human rights, who, yeah, a former human rights lawyer who has taken her talent for seeing um, the community and scenes and opportunities and really the lifestyle that people are going through and has been able to bring that forth in a very visual way. She is at the onset of launching her second book in the US. It's already been released overseas for those of you who are lucky enough to be over in Europe. Um, her first book, Welcome to Camp America, Inside Guantanamo Bay, was a powerhouse hit. Um, it is one of the 10 photo books that the New York Times Magazine called a must have. And for our program today, Necessary Fictions, she's gonna first guide us through the work that she did with that book and then take us into the book that she has coming out, Necessary Fictions, and also, if you stick around and you will want to, she's gonna give you a glimpse into her submission process for this program. She is being very generous, very open, very transparent with us today, and you are going to be in for a special treat. Alongside, to help moderate this discussion and really guide and direct this, is Elizabeth Avedon, who's an independent curator whose name I probably don't even have to tell you. She's a photo consultant who has been a former gallery director, creative director, and all around everyone wants person. And her projects have recognition and influence that span the globe, including, of course, Richard Avedon's In the American West. So with that, I'd like for my two beautiful guests to come on screen. We can have you to unmute and come on screen with me so that we can kick off today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you today to Debbie and Elizabeth. Hello, Hi. everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here and for everyone to get together. Debbie Cornwall is one of my favorite photographers. She works with two iconic women photographers, two of the best, Mary Ellen Mark and Sylvia Plotky. I'm just in awe of your, all of that you've done. 
So, uh, Debbie, you had a major success with your first book, um, Welcome to Camp America. Uh, that was Radius Books in 2017. Um, 2017, yeah. 2017. So, would you describe the project and the impact the book had on your career? Absolutely. Um, first of all, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. And I just want to acknowledge before we really get going, um, there's a lot happening in the world right now, today, this week, um, this summer, this year. And um, thank you for being here. Uh, we're, we're all struggling in, in some ways. Um, but I want us to spend this hour um, sharing with you um, my experience in making this work. And Hopefully, uh, the work that I'm going to share with you can contribute to a conversation about what's happening now. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen and start by telling you a little bit about Welcome to Camp America and how I came to make this book with Radius. Um, as B mentioned, I was a civil rights lawyer for a number of years in my past professional life. And when I stepped away from that, I decided I wanted to look at some of the same systemic questions that had always consumed me, um, abuses of power, civil rights, human rights, um, but in a different way for a new audience. And so Guantanamo was sort of an obvious choice for me, but what a hard subject to try to visualize this is the kind of thing that we all saw for so many years about Guantanamo. Um, it was the image, um, some version, orange jumpsuit, barbed wire fatigue that we would see if we Googled in the news. And many of us just stopped seeing, stopped looking. So how do you make a different kind of picture in a place where the military controls what you see and even if you can get there? So I had to do a lot of thinking about that as I went through the application process. And here's a glimpse of what that looks like. Pages and pages and pages of rules. You may not photograph anyone's face. Everything you photograph will be reviewed at the end of the day by military censors and whatever doesn't comply with their rules will be deleted. Um, a whole bunch of other lists, but no faces was really the big one. So once I finally got permission nine months later and a background check later, um, I had something sort of wonderful happen. I didn't plan on it. But as we were awaiting the ferry to go from the leeward side to the windward side uh, for the first of what became three visits, my military escort said to me, you know, Gitmo is the best posting a soldier could have. There's so much fun here. And I realized that was an opportunity. So the first of three different kinds of pictures for the project began as Gitmo at home, Gitmo at play. I decided to look at what I was being asked to see. I looked at the home and play spaces of both the guards and equivalent spaces for the detainees, the prisoners held without charge or trial. This is a, a uh, recreation pen uh, for detainees or prisoners in Camp Echo. Another prisoner space, it's a compliant detainee media room where inmates in solitary confinement who follow the rules might have the opportunity, if they're lucky, to watch a censor approved DVD with one leg shackled to the floor while being surveilled through a two-way mirrored window. And then the fun again, this is a place of many contradictions, a soldier lounging on Windmill Beach. Again, no faces are allowed. So here's the seaside galley celebrating Guantanamo as a tropical paradise down to its even design with the fish on the walls. But what does eating look like for an inmate? It looks like this feeding chair in Camp Five. Um, stark contrast. This might be an interrogation cell, but it's actually not. It is a band room uh, in the Liberty Center for Marines who are off duty who want to rock out in a padded room. 
juxtaposing these equivalent spaces back and forth. It's a prayer rug with an arrow to Mecca in Camp Echo. So coming to terms with Guantanamo Bay and, and the somewhat surreal experience of working in a place where everything was controlled, everything I had access to, everything I saw and limited, um, one of the other things that struck me was the gift shop. So a second later of photos um, was my next order of business. I bought out the gift shop. What could be more American than the commodification of power? The toddler sized t-shirt for $6.99. Crowd favorite, you may see it behind me on the mantle, my own personal Fidel bobblehead from Radio Gitmo for $20. Rockin' in Fidel's backyard is the tagline. A turkey vulture for $12.99. These absurd and yet mundane, everyday American objects celebrating both the carceral reality of Guantanamo and its tropical paradise. It's, it's sort of mind-blowing and it felt like an important element of the story to tell. The third layer that I wanna share with you before we look at the book itself, just so you understand the different pieces that went into it, um, is in my mind, perhaps the most important. It was my original idea to photograph the men cleared and released from Guantanamo after having spent years in prison without charge or trial. Some of them went home um, and resumed their lives, much like my former clients who I represented as wrongful conviction lawyer, um, although none of the men released from Guantanamo uh, is allowed to set foot on American soil, but many of them were sent to foreign countries where they may not even speak the language. So how do you convey in a picture all of this? I tried out a number of things, but I landed on this strategy. It was to photograph each of the 14 men I photographed in nine countries as though they were still being held in Guantanamo, not showing their faces. So this is Jamel in Algeria photographed facing home, which for him was a mattress on his brother's floor after he was released from Guantanamo after being held for almost 12 years. He's still wearing the same shoes he walked out of Guantanamo wearing. So he repeated this around the world. In Albania, I photographed Chinese Uyghurs and, and Uzbek. And in places like this where the men had to come to terms with what it meant to start their lives anew, separated from their own families in countries where they had no language, no people. We found locations that emphasized the disorientation that they experienced going to a new place. In Germany, with Murat, who spent almost five years in prison, when we went to a refugee housing camp, it turns out he's a refugee counselor and the architecture was very similar to the kind of container architecture that I had seen and photographed in Guantanamo Bay. So all these resonances visually and thematically uh, between Guantanamo and the free world. I'll show you a few more of these portraits. Sammy, an Al Jazeera cameraman who was uh, arrested crossing the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, covering the war for Al Jazeera. Now he's gotten a promotion. Uh, and so we photographed him behind the desk. And uh, lastly, Hussein, uh, a Yemeni sent to Slovakia after almost 13 years in prison without charge or trial who is here at midday prayer. He's been sent to a country where there are no mosques. So this is what's available to him. All of this is a lot to try to make sense of. And for me, the book form is the perfect way to do this because I can incorporate not only different kinds of pictures and use design to help um, invite the audience to look and engage and question, but also there is the opportunity to use text. So I'm gonna walk you through a number of these elements for the book. As you can see, it's a, an intimate size. 
The entire book is in both Arabic and English. And it starts out, you're not quite sure where you are. It's a little unsettling. There are redactions, black boxes of information you're not getting to see. And then there's text. It's testimony. I was a lawyer, apparently once a lawyer, always a lawyer. And that is a narrative thread that I weave throughout the book. It tells the story in the first person in sworn testimony of a man who was brutally injured while being taken out of a Guantanamo cell. And you only find out if you make it to the end of the book, who he is and why he's there. It's a surprise no matter who you are or what you think you know about Guantanamo. This is one of the brilliant innovations of my book designer, David Chickie. Each one of the 14 portraits of the cleared and released men is in this folio, arbitrarily inserted into, but not bound into the book. When he first suggested it, I thought, that's nuts. You can't do that, right? But on second thought, I realized it's perfect as a means of using design to convey a concept. It's arbitrary where they end up. The pages could fall out, they could be lost, they could be damaged. So too with the men who have been arbitrarily reinserted into the world. Here's another element of the book that I think is very important. I use a number of once classified government documents on the bureaucratization of violence. They are policy documents, definitions, interrogation manuals. And this fold out that you saw is a way of inviting the viewer. You get a little taste, it says, classified or not public. And you can choose at that moment whether to look or not. You can turn the page and not look. But if you do that, you know you chose not to. If you choose to look, you're taking a physical action. You're opening, you're turning the book, um, and you're getting a whole other layer of information. Um, so it, it took about three years from my first visit to Guantanamo Bay to the time when I held in it the first advanced copy of the book at the opening of my first international exhibition of this work in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, I'm going to stop my screen sharing just now, um, and I look forward to questions about this project as we move on okay. to the next thing. Well, I just briefly, how did the impact of this book, what was it on your career at that point, before and after? Yeah, beforehand, to be transparent, as B said, I want to be as transparent as I can. I tossed a little bit when I wrote my proposal to go to Guantanamo Bay, because at that point, I was a lawyer who liked to take pictures. I had a background 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier as a photographer, as you said, working for Mary Ellen, working for Sylvia Plocky, doing my own work. But so what I said was, I'm an independent photographer. I was a lawyer. Now I'm an independent photographer. And I would like to document the daily lives of both detainees and guards. And they let me in. And that was the first open door that led to so many other open doors that I have been incredibly fortunate um, the book, the finished product has been the biggest door opener of them all. I can, it encapsulates all of my thinking, all of my work, the many layers that I'm trying to get at through the pictures and the text. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer, I should be able to explain these things. You know, they say pictures shouldn't need captions. Well, it turns out I don't work that way. You can get one thing out of the pictures, but you're going to get a lot more if you spend time with any of my books. Um, so at portfolio reviews, um, I've gotten exhibitions, uh, offers, invitations in Paris and Korea and all over the world, really, because people have had the opportunity to sit with my work in the context of the book and submitting to awards. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have the book recognized for its design and, and for its concept as well. And that just introduces um, the work just to an audience that it would not otherwise have had the opportunity to, to, to see. 
So as the winner, one of the three winners of the Leica Women Photo Project, the first one, um, as an award winner, how did it uh, impact your next and newer uh, project and book? Or this did is it? a very short answer. It, it, I mean, $10,000 goes a very long way. Um, for all of you in the audience who are working on your own personal project, it is an investment. Some of us who are working at home, especially now with COVID, and there may not be an outlay of money, but it takes time. And that's time you're not spending on your job, hustling for your freelance gig um, or anything else. Um, for me, I travel for my work and for Necessary Fictions, which I'm excited to share with you in a, in a minute. Um, I did quite a bit of travel and that's where this incredibly generous like a photo project award went directly to. So it's, it's, that's, that's the short answer. The longer answer is I, I get to be here talking with you and in conversation uh, with, with you, Elizabeth, as a juror, with you, B, and with the in, like a community, um, that's an incredible opportunity uh, for exhibitions, for talks, um, and all kinds of other things. Yeah, we've got a few questions here in our chat that I'll toss over to you, Debbie. So we have one Hi. from David, and he says, how did you find a publisher? Uh -huh. That is such a huge question. Um, I kind of, I did a lot of research and I spoke to a lot of publishers. Um, let's see if I can boil it down into a nutshell and perhaps at the end we can come back to it because I want to make sure um, we see all the pictures. The first thing I did was look at books of photographers whose work I love. Who did they publish with? Did I like the design? Um, go to their website, go to a, a book fair and, and see what kinds of titles. Does mine fit? You know, my work is, it's, it's its own thing. And given the topics that I tend to look at, my work is not going to be um, viable for every kind of publisher. Yeah. Um, so I was in conversation with a number of different publishers um, Sometimes doing the Google thing where you figure out the emailing convention and you send off a, a PDF dummy and hope that someone will get it and download it and look at it and like it and call you back. Um, portfolio reviews were very important. Um, and in the case of Radius, I actually commissioned Radius publisher and designer David Chickie to design my book back when I was planning to publish with someone else. And though that didn't end up working out, but we were late enough in the design process and, and David and I had worked together so well at that point um, that we were able to submit to the Radius board um, as a nonprofit Radius, um, all of its publishing decisions have to be approved by its board. We were able to, to submit to them out of time and kind of sneak in at the last minute. Yeah, I like what you're saying. I, I got very fortunate. I have a question, I think, um, both for you, Debbie, as well as for you, Elizabeth, because when we look at you, Elizabeth, we know that, um, you know, you have been a curator for works of, of all types, kind of across the globe. And, you know, even with you, Debbie, it's, you know, your kind of artistry is of the mode of a Terrence Simon and kind of the work is exceptional in the visual, the kind of visionary, uh, kind of groundbreaking, entry of it. Uh, do you think that you could produce this as you did then in today's America, um, not particularly to COVID or perhaps with some of the restrictions and regulations we're seeing kind of for our nation as we have relationships with other nations? I, I don't see why not. I mean, I'm still working on books with um, some well-known overseas publishers for some uh, well-known photography, photographer, artists, I, I'm, you know, they're not announced, so I'm not going to be the one to announce them, but it's still carrying on. I'm always surprised, but the wheels are still going. People are still buying books. People, well, even, maybe even more so. Yeah. Um, people are still producing books and working on them, writing text for them, sequencing. It's all still happening as far as I can see, in my experience. What about you, Debbie? 
You know, I, I hope so. I hope this continues. I'm, I'm about to um, sort of formally release, at least in the U.S., Necessary Fictions, which, as you'll see, um, really does grapple with some of the big questions that we're all confronting right now. I mean, it looks like it's about one thing, but when you get the book in your hands and you go through and you see the context that I'm, I'm putting it all in, it, it really does confront these questions. And it's a question mark for me. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a nerve wracking thing um, to be putting a book out into the world right now. I, I, I know that it's been published, but um, we don't know how or whether it will be received and whether for me, the most important thing is that it, it does contribute to a conversation about what's happening now. That, that's really why I make the work. For me, the pictures are one means of communication among a range that I want to use to be engaging in critical inquiry and dialogue with people. Okay, perfect. I'm going to put a pin in that because there are so many questions coming through that we would have to hear all day. So we're going to kind of move and then just kind of navigate in as we dive further into kind of your Like a Woman project and necessary fiction. I just want to throw out a little bit of uh, things that I talk to my um, emerging photographers that I work with and also my students at School of Visual Arts, uh, grad students. Um, the importance of publishing a, a book for your career and you don't have to have one, but obviously it's an important milestone in any photographer's career to have a book. It gives you greater visibility, as we know, and exposure to the photography community. Um, you're marketing not only to the public at large, but also to every photo editor, curator, photo professional in the industry. Um, and maybe for a future longer talk, you know, the the, um, there are several issues to consider, which is who your audience might uh, possibly be. Have you thought about who your audience is going to be? Are you going to self-publish or versus traditional pu publishing? Um, I, having worked way back in the olden days on creating books by hand and on the floor and, you know, without computers, which took months, um, I'm a big proponent of print-on-demand books and self-publishing as well as the traditional. So, great. I'm I might be one of those people who doesn't uh, follow the norm there, um, but I do want to say to everyone, it, even if your work is not ready, you know, you haven't developed it, it hasn't ripened, it hasn't evolved far enough. That printing a print-on-demand sequence photo dummy of the work you have up to this point um, and uh, creating maybe a one-off copy for yourself. It's an incredible piece of, uh, of uh, a, a jewel for you. It's a great tool for you to put the work in perspective. It's like holding your work up to a mirror. You can see what works, what doesn't work, where you need to fill in the holes, whether you're really ready to pursue a you know, a, a proposal to a publisher. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm big on that. And if you're really, uh, you know, sort of starting out emerging photographer, you can make a small catalog or brochure of your work as a start to as a leave behind or promotional piece. So um, I, you know, there's a there's Debbie's up here. <laughs> and we all strive to get there. So um, I thank you, Debbie, very much for showing us this. Would you please show us a sneak peek of your upcoming book that comes out September 1st? Yes. Absolutely. Let me share my screen with you. And before I show you the physical book itself, what I would love to do is share with you exactly which 10 pictures that I submitted for the Like a Woman Photo Project Award as they were sequenced, and I'm going to read to you my proposal. Because um, I know when I started pr applying for grants, I had no idea what might be successful. Um, and it, it, it took some doing um, both to learn how to write and to feel confident enough to submit. Um, so anyone who's considering applying, I almost didn't apply because I just was convinced my work was so out of left field that it would not be viable. So, so here's, here's what I submitted. Despite the constant military conflicts since September 11th, war has receded in the American consciousness. 
war has become white noise, the almost invisible backdrop of our roiling social political moment, even as our civic life has become increasingly militarized at home. Meanwhile, entire industries have emerged to support the forever wars, both real and imagined. Inspired by my experience photographing at the US Naval Station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where military authorities staged managed the truth for public consumption, Necessary Fictions explores how fiction and reality blur within the post-September 11th fantasy industrial complex. In this time of political division and perpetual war, what are, what are the stories we're told? What games do we play? to manage unsettling reality. In Necessary Fictions, I photographed the mysterious landscapes and inhabitants of the country of Atropia. Are we in Afghanistan, Iraq, on a film set, or somewhere in between? Atropia, though fictional, actually exists. Mock Afghan and Iraqi villages have been constructed on military bases across the United States to host immersive, realistic military training exercises for troops preparing to deploy. I document these villages, battle scenarios, and cultural role players, civilian Afghans and Iraqis, many of whom have fled war only to recreate it, costumed in generic Arab garb in the service of the US military. In a mobile portrait studio I set up on site, I also make portraits of soldiers. They pose in front of a camouflage backdrop, many of them still teenagers, some smiling as though for class picture day, yet they appear mortally wounded. The military hires Hollywood makeup artists to paint fake wounds on real soldiers training for mass casualty events. War becomes a production in which the actors, civilian and military alike, enact imagined versions of their past or future selves. Shopkeeper, insurgent, suicide bomber, hero, victor, casualty of war. By looking at one corner of America's fantasy industrial complex, the war games industry, my goal is to invite critical inquiry among military and civilian viewers about a society in which war has become the rule rather than the exception. So that was, these are the 10 sequenced images and, and my proposal. And of course, there are many more images in the project. Uh, I think there are 125 in the book. And my thinking about it has really broadened over the course of making the work and pulling all the elements together for the book. I see the book not only as being about war now, but really about state-created realities. Again, the stories that we are told, how we consume them, commodify them, even embrace them. It's a touching off point, these pictures of war games for asking bigger questions. What is the link between the forever wars waged abroad and militarized policing at home. Um, and these are the kinds of themes that I'm exploring through the pictures and other materials like text, like testimony, um, and other things you'll find in the book um, to really broaden the frame. So back to bookmaking. How do you go from the pictures and the grants to the book? Sometimes you're really organized and as Elizabeth, you suggested, like have your dummy, put it together. And that is fantastic. That's what I did for my first project. I had a pretty good dummy when I connected with David. With this project, I was not quite so on top of things. I had so much material that when I went to meet with him in the studio in Santa Fe, this is what we did on every flat surface in the studio. I just laid out my proof prints. You can see I have text some there in the middle, um, some thinking about how do I fit in the text that I've drafted? How do we think about organizing all of this work um, in a way that is 
clear and coherent. Like, what do we include? What do we leave out? You can see here on the left side, I had a whole series of pictures made in military museums that were kind of bananas. Those did not end up making the book. Maybe there's another use for them, another life for them in an exhibition one day. Um, and we started coming up with categories. Um, and here is David's notebook um, as we started to think through how we might organize the book. And, and what we ended up with was a kind of book loosely modeled on a country report, like a, like a US State Department report for the fictional country of Atropia. So here is my, my second baby, if you will. Um, the second book with Radius, it's Necessary Fiction. And it's much larger than Welcome to Camp America. It's 324 pages, I think. Um, it's, it's weighty. There is a lot there, many different elements. Again, for me, the book form is the best way to do this. So introducing um, these moulage pictures, the fake injury pictures, with a sort of stream of consciousness discussion writing about post-traumatic stress. Like how is this affecting, how is perpetual war and specifically these pictures, uh, the, these um, moulage events, how's that affecting the people who are doing the training pretending to be gravely wounded, how it was war affecting us and those directly affected by it. The book also has a case study in it. And as with Welcome to Camp America, you know, I always have a couple of additional elements that feel critical to include in the book, but don't narratively fit streamlined. So this is a booklet uh, that comes out that's a case study. And here's one more design element. We've got three surprise pages in an envelope at the end of the book, organized as class pictures of the moulage soldiers. And it just didn't make sense to include them in the narrative thread of the book, but there's something about these smiling, injured soldiers that felt important to include. Um, so here is a sneak peek of the book as it is organized and bound, you see it's just, it's, it's just much bigger. So working with a designer like David, um, David Chicky made all the difference. I mean, I felt confident, I'm gaining confidence in the pictures, gaining confidence in the research and understanding how to get access and how to get in touch with the people responsible for different elements of, of these worlds that I'm trying to understand and photograph. But translating that into book form, I don't know how to do that on my own. The sequencing, the trim size, um, how much text is there going to be? What's it going to look like? Is it going to be every other page or is it going to be as necessary fictions? We ended up deciding mostly in small sections interspersed throughout the book. How do you organize it? How do you invite people in to make them curious to want to find out more? And for me, my work is really all about the, the final product, the book or the installation. Here's that insert. I want the finished product to be more than the sum of the parts. And I hope when you have a chance to spend time with a book, you will find it engaging and challenging and um, touching on questions that, that matter to us, whether we have anything to do with the military or war or not. It's really, it looks like it's about war and war games, but it's, it's really talking about much, much more. You see there's a lot of essays at the back. Um, there's poetry, stops here. And I am going to leave it here for a moment. The last thing I will say before I stop sharing my screen is that I'm thrilled to have a number of really talented writers contributing. And that's another element that I think a photo book can do that you don't get in, a, in an exhibition 
space. So we have poetry from an anthropologist who did her field work in these war game sites, Nomi Stone. There's an original short story by an Iraq war veteran who's an author, Roy Scranton. And then there are essays, scholarly essays from critical theorist Sarah Santillis, whose book, Draw Your Weapons, you might have seen or you might have read her article last year or in 2018 in the New York Times Magazine called Why We See Photographs of Some Dead Bodies and Not Others. And a historical perspective uh, from Harvard Art Museum's curator, Makita Best. Um, so again, my work is, I wanna be creating a context um, and, and the book just offers so many opportunities um, to do that. I'm, stop, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point. Bia, were there questions that came up? There are, but I'll let you go ahead and dive in. I know you had some follow-up to that or did you want me to kind of take over? Oh, I'm just uh, overwhelmed by, okay. by your upcoming book, so. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, while you gather your thoughts, we do have quite a few questions. Um, we have a few people Great. wanting to know what that timeline and process looks like, especially as it relates yeah. to kind of your initial concept to really um, all of the planning and execution. And I know kind of you and I, when we spoke briefly earlier, just the staging of something that is so visceral in the work. Yeah, um, this work takes time. It takes time to understand what I wanna go try to see and understand. It takes time to figure out how to get there, who to ask for permission. Often there's a negotiation involved. And then for necessary fictions, I, I think I mentioned for Welcome to Camp America, it was three years from the very first visit to Guantanamo till I had a book in my hands, but there's nine months before then where I was waiting for access. So that's much more close to four years. Yeah. And with Necessary Fictions, I started making photographs. I went to my first military site in October of 2016 when I knew that Welcoming to Camp America was in very good hands uh, with Radius. And so it's been about four years. Um, and, and that's an ambitious timeline. Um, I have really found though the sort of plaintiff's lawyer in me is oriented towards pushing and making things happen. There's value in that. Um, there's real value in that. And at the same time, ideas need time to percolate. I am really discovering how valuable it is to try something, try a sequence and put it aside. Maybe you show it to a couple of trusted friends, let their feedback sink in and come back to it, do something else, work on a different, work on your artist statement while you're letting that sequence percolate. Um, it just, it just feels necessary for the, for the way that I work. And, and I, think, I think that's a universal, whether your work involves research and access or not, give yourself room to breathe and let your ideas sink in. Awesome. I have, a, I have a question for you, Elizabeth, because I think as Debbie's describing what that process was like and how long it was for you as a curator, um, can you give us a bit of advice on how a photographer can know when they're ready for a book? And particularly, especially with someone who's working in that visual media, what the difference between a portfolio and a book are, so that it's not just, let me grab my portfolio and bind it and self-publish it, and there we go. Well, I will... I will say Gerhard Steidel of Steidel Books, one of the other better, the yeah. best photography book publishers said, a book is ready when it's ready. You really can't put a timeline on anyone's work. Um, the reason I suggested like, you know, making a book for yourself, don't, you don't have to show it to anyone else, is so that you on your own can see whether you're ready yet. Um, I'm gonna, recommend a book for everyone, if that's all right with you, um, yeah. because it actually discusses exactly what you're asking me, which is a much bigger subject than I think I could answer quickly, because every project is different, and, you know, it depends on what type of photographer you are, and I don't know that uh, we all know our own work is ready, um, so feedback at portfolio reviews and uh, competitions and some of those sort of things will help 
you know, tell you you're, you're in the right ballpark. All right. Um, Darius Himes and Mary Virginia Swanson publish your photography book. Um, it's one of the best. Uh, they're not as keen on self-publishing as I am, but um, they certainly have covered all bases and uh, whether you are ready and when you feel you're ready, how you can create a proposal, how you write it, who you send it to, et cetera. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to them. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I have a couple more questions that I'll kind of dive in. Um, and I think, I think this one uh, is really great, especially as we're speaking about the Like a Women Photo Project. Someone's asking, what is your Leica kit and what brought you to Leica? And I want to preface that with saying one of the great things about the Leica Women Photo Project um, for many of our Leica Academy workshops and the like is that you actually don't have to have a Leica. You don't have to have shot with the Leica to enter this competition because otherwise, why would you be given one as a gift? If you have one, that's fine. Um, but you do not need to own a Leica in order to participate in the Leica Women Photo Project Award. You also do not need a Leica to participate in many of our programs. But with that, Debbie, um, we do have the question. So I'd like to hear um, about the kind of gear and experience with your submission for the award, as well as the impact. And we actually do have for uh, everyone who's listening and as well as listening on the replay, we have a blog at our website that uh, covers our three winners to give you some insight and glimpse into what the impact of winning that award has done for them. But since we have Debbie here and on screen with us right now, I'll have her to dive into a little bit of that as well as some of the gear that she's used in creating the project. Great. Yeah, I am one of the people who did not have the luxury of a Leica uh, when I started the project. Um, and this was um, a project that I started working on in medium format. So I, you, I started the project with a Mamiya Pro 2D, uh, a digital medium format, um, and ended up completing it with medium format. Um, it's a little ridiculous to be schlepping around the desert with this huge tripod and, and large camera, but, but that's what I did. Um, so I'm really excited with the Q2 to be able to use that in my next project. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've got another one. So um, we have Raj saying, you know, very powerful work and thank you for sharing it with us. Um, for work that demands conceptualization to fully understand the scope, how would you pitch the work while applying for awards and grants and portfolios? Since in, in particular to the work that you've done, since these avenues may not allow you to put the work in perspective the way that your book does. And I think this is a great question because you spoke about how the process for access alone took nine months. And then there were, as a lawyer, you were able to kind of read through all that fine print, but there were myriads of rules and regulations about the work that you needed to do. And then you not only created that work, but then created really the impact after the fact. So given some insight into how to navigate those very scary waters, if you look at them from a legal standpoint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I understand the question, it's about how do you, how do you submit when like the work isn't finished and you need to do so much explanation for conceptual work. It's, it's really tricky, especially because my understanding of what I was doing and what the work is about has really evolved over time. So I read to you and it'll be on the, um, uh, available on the Leica website, um, the, the video of this event. I read you word for word what my proposal was for this award, and I'm constantly fine tuning it, right? So it's, it's the idea that I have, which I test when I go out and I make pictures, and then I come back and I see what I got, and I put things together, and maybe I find a new element that I hadn't realized was there, you know, and that becomes part of my statement. And then I go, to another site and I make more pictures and I reassess and you know part of what were in my core 10 or 12 this is a helpful thing to have your core 
10 or 12 pictures that are always the ones that are going to be your go-to for your submission. Maybe one or two get swapped out, but your strongest pictures that convey the essence of, of your concept or your project or whatever it is. Um, and the same with your artist statements or your proposals. You know, it's really helpful to have a 100 uh, word summary, a 250 word and a 500 word version. Um, and it, w we hate these word limits, but we have to live with them. And I've come around to believing that it's incredibly helpful to have to boil down your thinking um, to try to convey it. Again, I'm never, you're never gonna understand the work in a proposal like this in the way that you will having an experience with the physical object of the book or in a physical space of an installation. Um, but, but that's the challenge, right? Yeah. Um, our deadline for entries for the Like a Woman photo project of which Elizabeth is one of the jurors is October 8th. And so in light of what you just said, Debbie, where you just have to kind of grab that work and go, and in light of the fact that many people may be thinking, well, I have to have this submission in the next, you know, month and a half, how do I navigate that? For, for you, Elizabeth, I'd love to hear some advice or at least one tip that you can give for photo editing that you've learned over the years that really um, can help our participants or that really sticks with you as the activator for narrowing down something to be able to create a submission or to really be able to pull the best out. Okay, so if someone has a, you aren't sure and you have no one to work with, uh, I, I suggest not asking your family or your best friends and try to rely on yourself and look as though you're looking at it from outside, that it's not you choosing your photographs, it's him or her behind your back, you know? Um, so you're gonna take your one solid photograph, you know it's great, and you're gonna hold it next to each of the others, and they need to all be on the same level as much as possible. Um, and so it's a process actually for me, it's a process of elimination when I'm helping edit photographs for someone. Um, it's really looking for maybe that, that iconic image, at least for that person so far in their career. And also just go for it. I mean, you don't know what's, what is going to work and what isn't going to work if you've never tried it. I, I believe strongly in, in putting it out there. And um, I mean, you could always consult with someone and, and see which, what are your best 12 images or your best eight images and you just as debbie said you th those are your go-to images they're gonna and and also every time um, a professional sees those photographs whether it's in a contest an award or just being submitted um you start to build like uh, uh, an idea of who that person is uh, the photographer themselves so i say just go ahead and try it Okay, perfect. I hope that helps. Um, one of the other things for everyone to bear in mind is that for the Like a Women Photo Project Award, you're using the award to complete a project. So we are not looking for a published book, right? We're not looking for a finished work. Um, we're looking for you to make the pitch on the idea and a solid grasp and understanding of what that series will be. And then we equip you with the financial means and with the equipment means to be able to then go forth and complete that project. Um, but as we start to kind of look at the time and, and perhaps wrap up, Debbie, do you have any questions for Elizabeth that maybe have stemmed <laughs> from some of the questions that the attendees have had or going through your? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things that strikes me for curators, for people who jury awards is you must see so many images, you know, in going through, like thousands and thousands. Oh, we. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, I love it. I, it's just that feels like a lot. So, is there a way to articulate, like, what it is for you? And it's got to be different for every juror. Like, what is it that stands out for you? Um, maybe even, you know, what stood out in the judging, I know it was a year and a half ago, but with Eva and Yana, my, my fellow oh. awardees work, like, how, you know, for giving advice to, to people who are listening, 
think like what's going to get what's going to plant a, a seed of memory in the jurors' minds when they're looking at thousands and thousands of images a week? Well, first I look for a consistent look in the you know overall, so that each image isn't like one is a one is this big and one is this big. You know that the the whole view is sort of consistent. Um, the other thing is I I this is what I always want to see is um, could anybody have taken these photographs? You know, sometimes you're out in the field and anyone could have taken that snapshot or that photograph, or could only this person have seen it in this way? And that's what sort of makes some photographers or some work stand out. Um, you could have 10, 10 photographers take 10 photographs of a field in Maine, I'm making this up, but um, someone whose photographs are particularly uh, coming through as their own view or perspective or there's a little magic involved and you you feel it or you see it I can't really put it into words better than that but I that that works fine great yeah. great Any other or should we start to wrap it up yeah unless there are other questions um, from the audience sure yeah, we, 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 have, we have tons of questions. Um, I'll, 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 I'll let us answer three more questions. And then from that, um, we're going to kind of move. Some, some of them are kind of overlapping. Um, so we have one from Cindy. And she says, when, when photographing at Guantanamo Bay, was this just a one-time visit? Or were you allowed to photograph on numerous days? Um, and were you allowed to interact with the soldiers over those being held? Or were you essentially kind of only given like a stage moment. Yeah, access is always um, is always the question. Um, so I taking the second part first. There's no interaction with the men held there. Um, in fact, you only see them uh, once, and that is through one of those double-sided darkened windows. Um, and actually, the military authorities have each person carrying a camera cover the focus light um, that assesses focal distance because they didn't want the inmates to know that people were there with cameras because it would be disruptive. So that just felt um, deeply upsetting for me personally, just um, that people would be shown in that manner um, without awareness. Um, the, so, but I spent all day every day with a military escort. And I became curious about their lives. You know, what led them into their service? What, how, where had they been deployed? What's it like for them? Um, and that is part of what led me to the new project. And, and like, what's the human experience of preparing for war? So it's a lot to, to wrap one's head around. Um, and I, I think there was an element of the question about um, access and negotiation. Um, I think once I had found the right people to ask to get access to Guantanamo, I, I went back three times. Um, each visit is meant to be four days long and you can only photograph on two of them. My last visit was a little different because I heightened the level of difficulty by negotiating uh, to photograph with medium format film in that case rather than digitally which challenged the daily operational security review regime where they took the yeah. tip out of your camera, the memory card to do their review. So that was a whole song and dance I will not get into today. Um, but on that last visit, I was there for a week and photographed on three days of that week. Um, so very limited amounts of time. And with necessary fictions, um, it, it was less time intensive. I still had to figure out the different entities with the Marines. There's one place to go uh, with the Army. There's a, another place to go. And then I have to figure out where are the installations uh, that have these kinds of mock village sites I'm interested in, who's in charge there. Once I get there, who's in charge on the ground, which could be multiple people in charge of different things. So who do I build the relationship with? So that I know what's going to happen that day and make sure that I'm there to photograph the thing that I want to cover. Um, 
yeah, I hope I hope I answered at least some of the questions. No, that was great. Um, and and kind of connected to that, we have uh, another question um, from Aaron, who says, you know, why did you decide to, in a sense, fictionalize the narrative through the creation of Atropia, and how did that change your work of commentary with the issues you explore? I have my own theory about why that might be from what you just said, <laughs> but I'll let you. Yeah. Say. So for a documentary photographer and in my own case, a lawyer, like facts matter, right? But there was something about my experience of working in Guantanamo where the official view was one version. It was really packaged. Look how much fun we're having. And I knew there was more going on that I was not going to be shown. So that led me to think about state created realities as I said earlier, the kind of the staging and performance of American power. So I actually did not create Atropia. It is a product of the imagination of the American military. These mock village sites exist. They are populated with role players. All of this is happening, whether I'm there or not. Literally my only intervention, and I, I'm, I'm not a fly on the wall, not, we can, can have that whole conversation about what it means to be a, a documentary photographer. I definitely, had an impact um, by my very presence, but the active um, input that I had visually was to set up a mobile portrait studio for each of the photographs of moulaged National Guardsmen in training. So I had this uh, camouflage backdrop. I found out who was in charge, negotiated access, and, and came up with a system that in each new site, I would be there at 4.30 in the morning set it up and I would be ready with my lights, and I would be able to spend maybe five minutes with each person as they went from the makeup artist, the Hollywood makeup artist flown in for the, for the purpose before they were sent out in the field to do their training. And so much of this work is about building relationships. It's like you can't do that in five minutes, but you want to build a rapport to the point where it feels comfortable to ask, like, how does this feel for you to be dressed this way as you're preparing to deploy? And I write about some of those interactions in the book and some of them are hilarious. Some of them are incredibly poignant um, and really thought provoking. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of lift the light a little bit on the two of you. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the programs we have upcoming, but I'd love to hear how you all have gotten through this summer and what your summer has been like, um, kind of outside of the realms of, you know, or, or within kind of the realms of COVID and restrictions and, and just everything that everyone is adjusting to. Because especially for you, Elizabeth, you said the work continues and the opportunities continue. So looking into that. So um, I have to say, I love to work from home or I used to love to work from home. It used to be my favorite thing. And at first I thought, this is heaven. What are people complaining about? And uh, six months in now, I actually <laughs> am losing it. So I'm not as sharp as I could be or should be. Um, so I, I still have uh, jury things every week, every month. Uh, several, several things. I, I, the Texas Photographic Society this week and uh, Photo Lucida's um, Critical Mass. Um, I think people take a long time to do. I'm so used to editing so many photographs that I did it like in a few days. Um, but I, uh, there's several. Powerhouse. She's a powerhouse. Say it <laughs> The powerhouse. She's a powerhouse. <laughs> No, I don't, I'm just used to it. And I was ruthless. Usually I'm very nice, like overly nice. Like, okay, I'll let it in. Okay, okay. But I was ruthless and it, so it went pretty fast. You kind of have to be because there's so many great photographers and you've got to like do what you can. Debbie? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I obviously life has changed for all of us and, um, you know, fielding the wave of cancellations uh, of exhibitions and you know what, that's not what matters right now. What matters is our health and our 
safety and are looking out for each other and are speaking out on issues that matter to us. And so really um, fortifying relationship has been critically important for my, what remains of my sanity. <laughs> and, you know, preparing to release this book, I, you know, I held off talking about it for, for quite some time. It just didn't feel appropriate with everything else happening in the world. And I've, I've come around to thinking that it, that it has something to offer. Um, but I've actually, for now, I'm shifting to working with found footage uh, and making some videos um, of, of short films that are going to be related to necessary fictions, telling one story from the, from the um, inserted booklet, if you got the book, um, in a number of different genres. So it, it happens to be a, a good time to have discovered work that I can do at home on the computer. Okay, awesome. I'm so happy to hear all that. So thank you both for being with us. Thank you all for being with us. I just want to give my own kind of personal thank you and round of applause. Thank you. A round of applause to you, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you so much. You both were thank so you. It's a pleasure in helping move so much of the behind the scenes insight and process for photographers, what you two brought to the conversation today, people just don't get any info into. And it's where they get stuck and get bottlenecked. So thank you both for your generosity and for really guiding us through all of this. It's so inspirational and so very helpful. Thank, thank you so much. much. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye to the next program.